Imagining the Church as an Organism A truth's initial commotion is directly proportional to how deeply the lie was believed. It wasn't the world being round that agitated people, but that the world wasn't flat. When a well-packaged web of lies has been sold gradually to the masses over generations, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and its speaker a raving lunatic. Dresden James The ministry of the Holy Spirit has ever been to reveal Jesus Christ, and revealing Him to conform everything to Him. No human genius can do this. We cannot obtain anything in our New Testament as the result of human study, research, or reason. It is all the Holy Spirit's revelation of Jesus Christ. Ours is to seek continually to see Him by the Spirit, and we shall know that He, not a paper pattern, is the pattern, the order, the form. It is all a person who is the sum of all purpose and ways. Everything in the early church, then, was the free and spontaneous movement of the Holy Spirit, and He did it in full view of the pattern, God's Son. T. Austin Sparks The New Testament uses many images to depict the church. Significantly, all of these images are living entities. A body, a bride, a family, one new man, a living temple made up of living stones, a vineyard, a field, an army, a city, etc. Each image teaches us that the church is a living organism rather than an institutional organization. Few Christians today would disagree with that statement. But what does it mean in practice? And do we really believe it? The church we read about in the New Testament was organic. By that, I mean it was born from and sustained by spiritual life instead of constructed by human institutions, controlled by human hierarchy, shaped by lifeless rituals, and held together by religious programs. To use an illustration, if I try to create an orange in a laboratory, the lab-created orange would not be organic. But if I planted an orange seed into the ground and it produced an orange tree, the tree would be organic. In the same way, whenever we sin-scarred mortals try to create a church the same way we start a business corporation, we are defying the organic principle of church life. An organic church is one that is naturally produced when a group of people have encountered Jesus Christ in reality, external ecclesiastical props being unnecessary, and the DNA of the church is free to work without hindrance. To put it in a sentence, organic church life is not a theater with a script. It's a gathered community that lives by divine life. By contrast, the modern institutional church operates on the same organizational principles that run corporate America. The DNA of the church. All life forms have a DNA, a genetic code. DNA gives each life form a specific expression. For example, the instructions to build your physical body are encoded in your DNA. Your DNA largely determines your physical and psychological traits. If the church is truly organic, that means that it too has a DNA, a spiritual DNA. Where do we discover the DNA of the church? I submit that we can learn a great deal about it by looking into God himself. We Christians uniquely proclaim a triune God. In the words of the Athanasian Creed, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Yet there are not three gods, but one God. Classic Christianity teaches that God is a fellowship of three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. The God is a community of three, or a trinity, as theologians call it. Theologian Stanley Grenz writes, God's triune nature means that God is social or relational. God is the social trinity. And for this reason, we can say that God is community. God is the community of the Father, Son, and Spirit, 
who enjoy perfect and eternal fellowship. For many years I heard precise teachings on the doctrine of the Trinity, but they never had any practical application in my life. I found them highly abstract and impractical. Later I discovered that understanding the activity within the triune God was the key to grasping everything in the Christian life, including the Church. As Eugene Peterson has said, Trinity is the most comprehensive and integrative framework that we have for understanding and participating in the Christian life. Other theologians agree. Catherine Lacunga says, The doctrine of the Trinity is ultimately a practical doctrine with radical consequences for the Christian life. In the same vein, Miroslav Volf writes, The triune God stands at the beginning and at the end of the Christian pilgrimage and therefore at the center of Christian faith. The biblical teaching of the Trinity is not an exposition about the abstract design of God. Instead, it teaches us about God's nature and how it operates in Christian community. As such, it shouldn't be relegated to an end note to the gospel. Rather, it should shape the Christian life and inform the practice of the church. Throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus makes many statements that give us insight into his relationship with his Father. He says, Father, you loved me before the creation of the world. John chapter 17, verse 24. He also said, The world must learn that I love the Father. John chapter 14, verse 31. From these two texts alone, we learn that there was a mutual love flowing within the Godhead before the foundation of the world. In the opening chapters of Genesis, we discover that there is also fellowship within the Godhead. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Here we see the triune God taking counsel and planning. The Gospel of John teaches us further about the nature of the Godhead, namely that the Son lives by the life of the Father. Chapter 5, verse 26, and chapter 6, verse 57. The Son shares and expresses the glory of the Father. Chapter 13, verses 31 and 32, and chapter 17, verses 4 and 5. The Son lives within the Father, and the Father lives within the Son. Chapter 1, verse 18, and chapter 14, verse 10. The Son lives in complete dependence upon the Father. Chapter 5, verse 19. The Son reflects the Father in His words and deeds. Chapter 12, verse 49, and chapter 14, verse 9. The Father glorifies the Son. Chapter 1, verse 14. Chapter 8, verses 50 and 54. Chapter 12, verse 23. Chapter 16, verse 14. And chapter 17, verses 1, 5, 22, and 24. And the Son exalts the Father. Chapter 7, verse 18. Chapter 14, verse 13. Chapter 17, verses 1 and 4 and chapter 20, verse 17. Within the triune God, we discover mutual love, mutual fellowship, mutual dependence, mutual honor, mutual submission, mutual dwelling, and authentic community. In the Godhead, there exists an eternal, complementary, and reciprocal interchange of divine life, divine love, and divine fellowship. Amazingly, this same relationship has been transposed from the divine key into the human key. The passage has moved from the Father to the Son, from the Son to the Church. John chapter 6, verse 57, chapter 15, verse 9, and chapter 20, verse 21. It has moved from the eternal God in the heavenlies to the Church on earth, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Church is an organic extension of the triune God. It was conceived in Christ before time, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, and born on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Properly conceived, the Church is the gathered community that shares God's life and expresses it in the earth. Put another way, the Church is the earthly image of the triune God,
Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Because the church is organic, it has a natural expression. Accordingly, when a group of Christians follows their spiritual DNA, they will gather in a way that matches the DNA of the triune God, for they possess the same life that God Himself possesses. While we Christians are by no means divine, we have been privileged to be partakers of the divine nature. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Consequently, the DNA of the church is marked by the very traits that we find in the triune God. Particularly, mutual love, mutual fellowship, mutual dependence, mutual honor, mutual submission, mutual dwelling, and authentic community. Put another way, the headwaters of the church are found in the Godhead. It is for this reason that Stanley Grenz could say, The ultimate basis for our understanding of the church is in its relationship to the nature of the triune God Himself. Theologian Kevin Giles echoes this thought when he says that the Trinity is the model on which ecclesiology should be formulated. On this premise, the inner life of the Trinity provides a pattern, a model, an echo, or an icon of the Christian communal existence in the world. Simply put, the Trinity is the paradigm for the Church's native expression. Beloved theologian Shirley Guthrie unfolds this concept by describing the relational nature of the Godhead. The oneness of God is not the oneness of a distinct, self-contained individual. It is the unity of a community of persons who love each other and live together in harmony. They are what they are only in relationship with one another. There is no solitary person separated from the others. No above and below. No first, second, third in importance. No ruling and controlling and being ruled and controlled. No position of privilege to be maintained over against others. No question of conflict concerning who is in charge. No need to assert independence and authority of one at the expense of the others. Now there is only fellowship and communion of equals who share all that they are and have in their communion with each other each living with and for the others in mutual openness, self-giving love and support, each free not from but for the others. That is how Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are related in the inner circle of the Godhead. Look again at the triune God and notice what's absent. There's an absence of command-style leadership, there's an absence of hierarchical structures. There's an absence of passive spectatorship. There's an absence of one-upmanship. And there's an absence of religious rituals and programs. Some have suggested that there is a graded hierarchy within the Trinity, but this view is scripturally and historically untenable. Command-style relationships, hierarchy, passive spectatorship, one-upmanship, religious programs, etc., were created by fallen humans, and they run contrary to the DNA of the triune God, as well as the DNA of the Church. Sadly, however, after the death of the apostles, these practices were adopted, baptized, and brought into the Christian family. Today, they have become the central features of the institutional Church. Four Paradigms for Church Restoration There are four chief paradigms for reimagining the Church today. They are as follows. 1. Biblical Blueprintism Those who advocate this paradigm champion the idea that the New Testament contains a meticulous blueprint for church practice. To their minds, we simply need to tease out of the Bible the proper blueprint and mimic it. But as I shall argue in this audiobook, the New Testament contains no such blueprint for church practice. Neither does it contain a list of rules and regulations for Christians to follow. As New Testament scholar F. F. Bruce puts it, in applying the New Testament text to our own situation, we need not treat it as the scribes of our Lord's day treated the Old Testament, 
We should not turn what were meant to be guidelines for worshippers in one situation into laws binding for all time. 2. Cultural Adaptability Those who advocate this paradigm are quick to point out that human culture changes over time. The Church of the First Century adapted to its culture. Today the culture is very different, so the Church must adapt to its present culture. Champions of this view say that in every age the Church reinvents itself to adapt to the current culture. This paradigm is based on the idea of contextualization. Contextualization is the theological method that tries to translate the biblical message into different cultural settings. Contextualization is certainly needed when we apply Scripture. It's because of contextualization that we don't wear sandals, togas, speak Greek, and use horses for transportation. However, some people wave the contextualization flag to the point of over-contextualizing the Scriptures until they have no present relevance at all. Over-contextualization eats up the biblical text to where it disappears entirely, and we are left to create the church after our own image. F.F. F. Bruce warns against the dangers of extreme contextualization, saying, The restatement of the gospel in a new idiom is necessary in every generation, as necessary as its translation into new languages. But in too much that passes for restatement of the gospel, the gospel itself disappears, and the resultant product is what Paul would have called another gospel which in fact is no gospel at all. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. When the Christian message is so thoroughly accommodated to the prevalent climate of opinion that it becomes one more expression of that climate of opinion, it is no longer the Christian message. I've met many advocates of the cultural adaptability paradigm, and I've been fascinated to discover that every one of them believes that there are normative church practices that transcend time and culture. For instance, most Christians who hold to the cultural adaptability paradigm would find the suggestion that we should abandon water baptism and change the Lord's Supper from bread and wine to french fries and mugs of root beer to be offensive. Those under 10 years old may be the exception. The critical question then becomes which practices of the New Testament church are solely descriptive and which are normative? Or to put it another way, which are tied to the culture of the first century and which are reflections of the unchanging nature and identity of the church? The dangers of over-contextualization are real, and not a few Christian leaders have been unwittingly guilty of it. We must be careful not to hold to biblical principles unconsciously when they suit our purposes, but abandon them in the name of contextualization when they do not. The matter of the fact is, virtually all Christians derive their ideas of the Christian life and church life from the Bible. Ironically, those who claim that they do not nearly always end up turning to the teachings of Jesus or Paul to support or condemn a particular idea or practice. The early church was not perfect. If you doubt that, just read 1 Corinthians. So, romanticizing the early Christians as if they were flawless is a mistake. On the other hand, the first century church was the church that Jesus and the apostles founded. And insofar as the first century communities were fleshing out the teachings of Jesus and the apostles, they can teach us a great deal. To ignore them as irrelevant for our time is a gross mistake. In the words of J.B. Phillips, The greatest difference between present-day Christianity and that of which we read in these, the New Testament letters, is that to us it is primarily a performance, to them it was a real experience. We are apt to reduce the Christian religion to a code, or at best, a rule of heart and life. To these men it is quite plainly the invasion of their lives by a new quality of life altogether. 3. Post-Church Christianity This paradigm is rooted in the attempt 
To practice Christianity without belonging to an identifiable community that regularly meets for worship, prayer, fellowship, and mutual edification. Advocates claim that spontaneous social interaction, like having coffee at Starbucks whenever they wish, and personal friendships embody the New Testament meaning of church. Those who hold to this paradigm believe in an amorphous, nebulous, phantom church. Such a concept is disconnected with what we find in the New Testament. The first century churches were locatable, identifiable, visitable communities that met regularly in a particular locale. For this reason, Paul could write a letter to these identifiable communities, that is, local churches, with some definite idea of who would be present to hear it. See Romans chapter 16. He would also have a good idea of when they gathered. See Acts chapter 20 verse 7 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and the struggles they experienced in their life together. See Romans chapters 12 through 14 and 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 8. While unbiblical in its viewpoint, the post-church paradigm appears to be an expression of the contemporary desire for intimacy without commitment. And finally, four, organic expression. Throughout this audiobook, I will argue for this particular paradigm. I believe that the New Testament is a record of the church's DNA at work. When we read the book of Acts and the epistles, we are watching the genetics of the Church of Jesus Christ expressing itself in various cultures during the first century. Because the church is truly a spiritual organism, its DNA never changes. It's the same biological entity yesterday, today, and tomorrow. As such, the DNA of the church will always reflect these four elements. 1. It will always express the headship of Jesus Christ in His church, as opposed to the headship of a human being. I'm using the term headship to refer to the idea that Christ is both the authority and the source of the church. 2. It will always allow for and encourage the every member functioning part of the body. 3. It will always map to the theology that's contained in the New Testament, giving it visible expression on earth. And 4. It will always be grounded in the fellowship of the triune God. The Trinity is the paradigm informing us on how the church should function. It shows us that the church is a loving, egalitarian, reciprocal, cooperative, non-hierarchical community. F.F. F. Bruce once said, Development is the unfolding of what is there already, even if only implicitly. Departure involves the abandonment of one principle or basis in favor of another. All that enables the church to reflect the triune God is development. All that hinders it from doing so is departure. As George Barna and I have argued in our book, Pagan Christianity, very little of what is practiced in the modern institutional church has its roots in the New Testament. Instead, human-invented practices that were spawned centuries ago have both shaped and redefined the church. Such practices undermine the headship of Christ, hamper the every-member functioning of Christ's body, violate New Testament theology, and disaffirm the fellowship of the triune God. As Emil Brunner puts it, the delicate structure of the fellowship founded by Jesus and anchored by the Holy Spirit could not be replaced by an institutional organization without the whole character of the Ecclesia being fundamentally changed. Yet despite this fact, many of these practices are justified by Christians even though they lack biblical merit. Why? Because of the incredible power of religious tradition. Consider the following texts. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8. For the word of God is living and active 
Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 And, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 and 11. These texts inform us about the enormous power of God's Word. The Word of God stands forever. The Word of God will accomplish whatever God desires. The Word of God will achieve the purpose to which God has sent it. The Word of God will not return void. Yet despite the incredible power of God's Word, there is one thing that can stop it dead in its tracks. That one thing is religious tradition. Note the words of Jesus, the incarnate Word. Thus you nullify the Word of God for the sake of your tradition. Matthew chapter 15, verse 6. And again, Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. You are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. Mark chapter 7, verses 8 and 9. In so many ways, religious tradition has shaped our minds. It's captured our hearts. It's framed our vocabulary. So much so that whenever we open our Bibles, we automatically read our current church practices back into the text. Whenever we see the word pastor in the Bible, we typically think of a man who preaches sermons on Sunday mornings. Whenever we see the word church, we typically think of a building or a Sunday morning service. Whenever we see the word elder, we typically think of someone on a church board or committee. This raises an important question. How can we read our present church practices back into the New Testament so easily? One of the reasons is because we have inherited a cut-and-paste approach to Bible study. In this approach, out-of-context proof texts are pieced together to support man-made doctrines and practices. This process is largely unconscious, and two things make it very easy. First, the New Testament letters aren't arranged in chronological order. Second, the New Testament letters are divided into chapters and verses. Philosopher John Locke articulated the problem well when he wrote, The scriptures are chopped and minced, and, as they are now printed, stand so broken and divided that not only the common people take the verses usually for distinct aphorisms or rules, but even men of more advanced knowledge in reading them lose very much of the strength and force of the coherence and the light that depends on it. By contrast, when the New Testament is read in chronological order, without chapters and verses, a beautiful narrative emerges. A story materializes. When we read the New Testament as it's presently arranged, however, we encounter that story in fragments, and we miss the fluid narrative. In Greek mythology, a man named Procrustes was reputed to possess a magical bed that had the unique property of matching the size of the persons who lay upon it. But behind the magic was a crude method for creating a one-size-fits-all bed. If the person lying on it was too small, Procrustes would stretch the person's limbs out to fit the bed. If the person was too large, Procrustes would chop off his limbs to make him fit. The modern concept of church is a Procrustean bed. Scriptures that do not fit the shape of the institutional church are either chopped off, meaning dismissed, or they are stretched to fit its mold. The cut-and-paste method of Bible study makes this rather easy to pull off, no pun intended. We lift various verses out of their chronological and historical setting and then paste them together to create a doctrine or support a practice. 
By contrast, the chronological narrative provides a control on our interpretation of Scripture. It prevents us from cutting and pasting verses together to make the Bible fit our preconceived ideas. The fact is, many of our present-day church practices are without scriptural merit. They are human-invented practices that are at odds with the organic nature of the church. They do not reflect the desire of Jesus Christ, nor do they express His headship, nor His glorious personality, the very things that the church is called to bear. Instead, they reflect the enthronement of man's ideas and traditions, and as a result they smother the church's native expression. Yet we justify them by our cut-and-paste hermeneutic. Violating the Church's DNA Some Christians have tried to justify a slew of unbiblical church practices by suggesting that the church is different in every culture, and it adapts to the world in which it lives. It is thought, therefore, that God now approves of the clergy system, hierarchical leadership, the performance spectator order of worship, the single leader model, the concept of going to church, and a host of other practices that were created around the 4th century as a result of Christians borrowing from the Greco-Roman customs of their day. But is the church really different in every culture? And if it is, does that mean that we are free to adopt any practice we like into our corporate worship? Or is it possible that the church has over-adapted to modern Western culture in both its theology and its practice? Speaking of the problem of over-contextualization, Richard Halverson writes, When the Greeks got the gospel, they turned it into a philosophy. When the Romans got it, they turned it into a government. When the Europeans got it, they turned it into a culture. And when the Americans got it, they turned it into a business. I will borrow from Paul when he said, Does not nature teach you? The New Testament is clear that the church is a biological entity. See Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32, Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. This biological entity is produced when the living seed of the gospel is planted into the hearts of women and men, and they are permitted to gather together naturally. The DNA of the church produces certain identifiable features. Some of them are the experience of authentic community, a familial love and devotion of its members to one another, the centrality of Jesus Christ, the native instinct to gather together without static ritual, the innate desire to form deep-seated relationships that are centered on Christ, the internal drive for open participatory gatherings, and the loving impulse to display Jesus to a fallen world. While the seed of the gospel will naturally produce these particular features, how they are expressed may look slightly different from culture to culture. For instance, I once planted an organic church in the country of Chile. The songs they wrote, the way they interacted with each other, the way they sat, what they did with their children, all looked different from organic churches born in Europe and the United States. However, the same basic features that reside in the DNA of the church were all present. Never did any of these churches produce a clergy system, a sole pastor, a hierarchical leadership structure, or an order of worship that rendered the majority passive. In nature, there's a flowering shrub called the big leaf hydrangea. If you take the seed of that shrub and plant it in the soil of Indiana, it will yield pink flowers when it blooms. But if you take that same seed and plant it in the soil of Brazil or Poland, it will produce blue flowers. Even more interesting, if you take the same seed and plant it in another type of soil, it will yield purple flowers. The big leaf hydrangea, however, will never produce thorns or thistles. 
It will never bear oranges or apples, and it will never grow tall like a pine tree. Why? Because these features are not within the DNA of the seed. In the same way, the Church of Jesus Christ, when planted properly and left on its own without human control and institutional interference, will produce certain features by virtue of its DNA. Like the big leaf hydrangea, the church may look different from culture to culture, but it will have the same basic expression wherever it's allowed to flourish. On the other hand, when we humans introduce our fallen systems into this living organism, the church loses her organic features and produces a foreign expression that runs contrary to her DNA. To put it bluntly, it's possible to distort the organic growth of the church and violate its DNA. Let me tell a tragic story that illustrates this principle. On November 4, 1970, a very unusual 13-year-old girl was discovered. From early childhood, she had lived in a state of intense sensory and social deprivation. Jeannie, as she came to be called, wasn't taught to speak, and she was denied normal human interaction. Jeannie was tied to a potty chair and left to sit alone day after day. In the evenings, she was tied into a sleeping bag, which restrained movement of her arms. She was also beaten for making noises, including forming words. The result? Her natural traits were permanently distorted. Jeannie had a strange bunny-like walk. She constantly held her hands up in front of her body like paws. She couldn't chew solid food, and she could hardly swallow. She also spat constantly, sniffled often, and couldn't focus her eyes beyond 12 feet. Jeannie's speech was limited to short, high-pitched squeaks that were barely understandable. After years of being removed from her abysmal home life, Jeannie's vocabulary grew significantly, yet she wasn't capable of stringing words together into meaningful sentences. What happened? Some scientists concluded that her normal DNA was altered because she was deprived of proper nutrition and stimulation. Let's apply this story to the spiritual realm. Like the big leaf hydrangea, the culture in which an organic church is born may influence its expression. At the same time, like Jeannie's tragic experience, the culture can also distort the church's expression by interrupting its organic growth. In my opinion, that's exactly what has happened with the church historically. Hence, what passes for church today is not what God had in mind from the beginning. The church is organic. If her natural growth is not tampered with, she will grow up to be a beautiful girl, a living witness to the glories of her bridegroom, Jesus Christ. She will not grow up to be an organization like General Motors or Microsoft. She will be something wholly different, completely unique to this planet, just as unique as Jesus Christ was when he walked this earth. For after all, the church is his very body, and its nature is identical to God's. That said, this audiobook is an effort to reimagine church in the image of the triune God. It seeks to anchor the practice of the church in the eternal Godhead rather than in the shifting sands of cultural fads, the muddied bottom of biblical blueprintism, or the polluted waters of religious tradition.